Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. We've got an exciting webinar with two great professionals in the IP space, the automation webinar series, IP innovation and patent drafting automation, mostly uh, hosted by Steven Lundberg and Michael Drabkin. Um, Steven Lundberg is a registered patent attorney and founding partner of Schwegman, Lundberg and Wassner. He works with entrepreneurs, Fortune 100 companies and everything in between, providing practical legal counseling and winning time-tested IP strategies. You know, he's a thought leader in the space, uh, member of the Bar of Minnesota and the USPTO. And our next uh, professional that we have is Michael Drapkin of Holland and Hart. Um, he counsels some of the world's most innovative technology companies in protecting their intellectual property, guiding them in the strategic development and management of their patent portfolios. And much of his practice is, is concentrated within the electronics and computer fields with an emphasis on wireless communications, semiconductors, software, and complex medical devices. He grew the Holland Hart team from five practitioners to fifth, over 50 in 10 years, leveraging automation and novel staffing methods, which is the topic of conversation today. So welcome, Stephen, and welcome, Michael. Thank you, Dan. Happy to be here. Well, we're seeing a lot of uh, things happen and exponential technologies that have happened over the previous decades and I'd love to hear your thoughts on how that has impacted the IP industry over the last 20, 30, 40 years and where you think we're going. Well, let me, uh, I guess I, we've got a, a slide up here, Dan. I'll just kind of uh, go walk through that quickly. Um, dating myself here, but when I started in the profession, which was in the early 80, 80s, uh, we were uh, pretty happy to have a fax machine. We considered that to be uh, some pretty high technology. It was innovative for its time, and obviously we've come a long way since then. But uh, in the 90s was uh, the digitization era. We started to use email in the mid-90s, and that grew into use of the web in the late 90s, early 2000s. Things started to go online. Uh, we started to have access to data around the world, IP data. You could get it you know, at your desk. The same data could be shared with the team in India. And during the 2000s, then, we sort of had an outsourcing um, phase where more and more work was sent to India for back office work. A lot of it stayed here. And now we're kind of at another fulcrum point, you know, in my opinion, which is uh, a lot of companies that outsource to India now no longer really understand whether or not they're saving money anymore. In fact, I think a lot of them aren't saving any money, but they don't have anything to compare it to anymore because they've been outsourced for so long. And, and so we're, we're now moving into the automation era, which uh, frankly will take the place of a lot of the work currently being done that's on the rote sort of end of the scale in India. Um, and we're kind of moving into that. And today we'll talk about with, with Michael Drapkin, who's one of the leaders in, in automation in our industry, um, you know, quite a bit about uh, automated drafting tools. And then we'll kind of finish up with a little bit about um, automated docketing at the very end. But kind of want to uh, get Michael's take on kind of where we're at currently and, and uh, what he thinks the future holds for us. Well, thanks, Steve. Um, yeah, the, um, I, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of technology things that are setting us up right now. Um, the, the key things that I, I'm sure you've seen, and I'd love to get your thoughts on this as well, um, for all of us um, who practice and serve large corporations, you know, we've had continuing downward budget pressure for the last uh, certainly 15 years or so. Um, at the same time, the volume has increased substantially. The number of practitioners uh, is in a long-term downward trend. There's half as many people coming out of law school now as there were 10 years ago. Um, our costs in staffing, uh, you know, overhead don't change, they go up. And we have to file things of higher quality and more quickly. And all of those things are really putting a tremendous pressure on practitioners and I think really making us all take a close look at what can be automated and what's the best path forward because if you are you know highly leveraged practice you're trying to drive new work grow work 
there's not the practitioners to do it, and yet you have all these other constraints. And the answer really to us, one of the key parts of the, the equation was automation. And, and I, I really, uh, well, I, 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 would, I would just um, repeat everything you said uh, with even more emphasis. Uh, you know, we've got, our costs just keep going up on the prosecution, the law firm side anyways, and the price pressure is, is uh, still pretty intense. So we're not getting much in terms of price increases, but yet our costs are going up every year as, as we have to pay more to get staff and we have to pay more for insurance, we have to pay more for rent and we have to pay more for health insurance. So we keep getting squeezed on our end, but yet the pricing is not going up. And that's not a complaint, that's just an economic reality. And so what that really requires us to do is to, is to innovate and to automate and my, you know, my thinking is is that if you're not aggressively trying to figure out how to do these things, you're going to be in a very difficult position to compete in in the uh, IP prosecution business, um, you know, in the years ahead. Steve, one thing I've when I look at this data of you know, basically higher demand and fewer practitioners, you know, my thought would be. You know, why are we not seeing price increases? Why do you think that's going on? Um, and because at, at some point in time that has to break, um, do you think it's that people are adopting automation and, and leveraging technology so they're more efficient or are there other factors at play here? Uh, you know, I, I'd say um, it's a very good question and it is a little bit puzzling. Um, it's kind of, in some ways, it's sort of like the puzzling question of why is there no inflation um, at all? Uh, but I, I think part of it is is there's um, a tremendous amount of pricing power that um, our clients have, um, and that it basically makes it difficult to move the needle on price increases. But eventually, something will probably break loose. But it certainly isn't uh, showing any signs of it at the at the moment. But yeah. You know, one thing I'd like to mention for the um, attendees is you can list any questions and at the end of the uh, webinar, we're going to take some time to um, answer some of those questions as time um, permits. So yes, I, one, um, the other thing I just wanted to mention about this slide that you just put up, Dan, is some things that 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 Steve, you may agree with me, that are really um, creating some of this uh, kind of price stagnation in that um, many of the corporate law departments um, have much more sophisticated IP operations uh, groups now and are really thinking about the right people to do the right type of work. Um, fixed fees have kind of come in and taken hold and um, really are kind of the, the standard across the industry now. Um, there is There are a lot of, of metrics that be, are being tracked as far as timing and quality. And there, there is competition from kind of new, ent new entrants, whether, um, whether it be you know, India or just non-traditional practitioners in the US. I think that, that may ha you know, be playing a, a role in keeping prices down. But I, I don't think that that's to, to your point, I don't think it's going to last forever. Yeah, and I would I would agree with that. And certainly, one thing that we've seen is the um, capabilities of the in-house departments have grown um, tremendously in the last you know 10, 20 years um, in terms of sophistication of managing you know large prosecution dockets. Uh, there's there's just a lot more focus on cost control and uh, quality, a lot of more focus on quality. Um, so, it, you know, definitely I think those things combine to, you know, being able to be more sophisticated with managing, you know, your suppliers and, and so on and so forth. So that, that was something we didn't have a, a lot of 20 years ago and today it's commonplace. You know, and maybe Michael and Steve, you could talk a little bit about quality as it relates to some of these enabling layers of technologies like natural language processing, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. What 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 do you see 
um, or how are you able to kind of get that effectiveness or efficiencies um, with your new technologies you're rolling out? Uh, what are you excited about? Michael, you want to take that first? Um, you know, I, I think that a lot of the automation that we're building, um, the, the idea is to take away things that, that are routine, repeatable, and can be learned uh, be, because of that. And so all of these underlying technologies are really enabling us to, to, to innovate and, and create these solutions. So um, I, I think, you know, the way to think of it is there's this backdrop where we have to be more efficient, faster, where the demands on us have never been as high, just like they've never been as high on in-house uh, patent departments. But all these fantastic new tools are coming along, and there are data scientists and developers who are learning how to leverage and, and work closely with us. And so we're kind of a, a very exciting time in the industry. We'll, we'll, we'll go through some of the things that we're doing, um, but I think, you know, what I'm interested in is how fast some of these things have come on. Um, certainly so, some of the innovations around examiner statistics and things going on at the PTO have really blossomed in the, in the past few years much faster than I thought they would. But um, the challenge of automated patent drafting uh, is still elusive and is is slower on the uptake, and I, I don't know why that is, but I think it's something that that everybody is going to uh, be adopting in the next ten years or so. Um, a few years ago, we we had a a panel at, at uh, an AIPLA event, and I asked uh, I was I was moderating and asked how many people have um, you know are regularly using automated drafting tools? And, and the answer was nobody. And we asked in three years, how many people will be using automated drafting tools? And only about 20% of the people raised their hands. I'd say right now, especially just given what's happening in the market and that, that there's really been a change in the way that people are thinking about it. I think that we're gonna, um, you know, if you ask people now, how many, how many are you be using auto automated drafting tools in, in three years? you get a number more like 75 to 80 percent of the practitioners. Steve, yeah, I would, yeah, well, I would echo that 100 um, percent. You know, I think at, at Schweigman, we've always been very interested in, in any type of automation. And probably one of the, the things that we were most intimidated by really was, was uh, you know, attempting to automatically draft uh, applications. But um, we found that we've had to go that direction in order to, you know, maintain the kind of competitive advantage that we want. So we've worked hard and we've had some partners here that have really put a lot of effort into propagating tools to, you know, help automatically draft applications. Um, we're using um, some of our own homegrown things and, and also tools available from others. And I know, Michael, you've, you've got a wonderful tool that your firm developed, which I think is giving you some, some great competitive advantage, uh, which we're going to learn about here. I want to back up a step on, you know, in terms of where we're at in terms of automation in the, in the profession. And I think there's a lot of things that we're doing now that are quote unquote, we're starting to do now that are quote unquote artificial intelligence, but um, and, and there's definitely machine learning being done a lot for analytics and other things. but the the artificial intelligence that we're using now is is i think more on the primitive end of the scale in general and but what's enabling all of that to take place is really the proliferation of the availability of the data because you can't do very much in the ip space unless you've got good data in order to get good data you got to get good data out of the patent offices and the data has to flow back and forth between the law firms and the customers as freely as possible, and we'll talk about this at the end, but I'll put a plug in there right now, is that the you know one of the single biggest enablers for cut cost cutting is going to be better APIs and open APIs in the industry. We've got a number of players that have got fairly open APIs, which we're really grateful for. Um, you know, CPA Global has been very good with keeping their APIs open. And C, uh, CPI, Computer Packages, has, has been good with that. AppCall has been good with that. There's others 
Um, I've also been um, good with that, Patrick's. Um, and we've had some others that, you know, have been trying to create silos. And I think that's going to be very, make it harder and harder to automate. I mean, then one last comment, just in terms of the automation pipeline. I mean, one of the first things that a lot of corporations did was uh, basically get rid of inefficiencies in-house was push those responsibilities back onto the law firms. So the law firms are sitting around typing data into these systems, and which is good for the corporations, but ultimately it doesn't really improve uh, efficiency. It just shoves it into a different direction. Um, and so hopefully, you know, we're in an era now where we're going to be able to automate more and more. So let's move ahead there on the slide deck. You know, what, one point I'd like to make out is, is for you guys to talk a little bit about your backgrounds and why you got interested in patent law, because I think a lot of the attendees are probably the, the artificial intelligence, machine learning, data science in general is a little bit intimidating. It's a little bit out of their comfort zone, um, but you have a pretty interesting background in software engineering or uh, double E, and maybe you could talk a little bit about your background and, and you know, how that you know, proclivity towards um, software engineering has allowed you to accept it quickly because you can understand it and then and then roll it out in your firms. But a little bit about your background so people aren't so intimidated by some of these things and can understand where you came from. Michael, you want to go first on that? Sure, sure. So a um, couple of interesting things. I went to law school. Um, I went to UC Davis and um, had had not um, did, did not enter patent law right away. Um, I did a judicial clerkship um, for a federal district court. Um, worked for um, uh, the Department of Justice for a while, but really wasn't um, just very fulfilled. And so I, I decided to go back and was going to get my PhD um, and um, and with really a focus on electrical engineering. And I, I came into uh, the patent space and I just absolutely fell in love. I, and I cut that short and I, I just knew that, that patent law was the perfect career for me. Um, so I ended up getting a master's instead. So, um, but I didn't have a passion for automation the, the entire uh, way along. It was really driven much more by, by the, the, the market. Um, we were uh, rapidly growing. Um, we had some demands from our clients where we had to file patent applications that were very robust in very short order. Uh, and much of this filing was driven by uh, standards meetings. And so because of this kind of big, significant amount of filing that we had to do in a very, very short period of time, we really needed to figure out how to do things faster. Um, and so we also had to have a certain type of style and quality and structure that we had set up so that it was very consistent as we grew the team that we would have it maintain our, our quality and consistency. So through this structure, and through this very kind of predictable way that we would draft patent applications and the desire to draft things faster, everything that was kind of wrote, we started to take a very close look at. And we had some developers on our team that were spectacular and they really were pioneers. They looked at what was going on and they bit by bit pulled, you know, we first started to automatically draft the summaries and then we uh, started to take a look at flowcharts and see if we could automatically draft the, the language for that. Then we started to, to play with uh, Visio. And it was really an evolutionary uh, uh, market-driven look at how do we make this better? Not a grand plan. I wish I, I said I, I saw it all coming. We were really just trying to, to get a result for our clients. And you know, one day the, 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 you know, the light bulb went off and we started to make these tools very user friendly and make them available to the entire team and create, you know, user friendly UIs. And it was a very evolutionary process that, that started, um, you know, maybe 2013, 2014, and has evolved to where we are today. So um, 
where the tools have evolved to today, and there are many um, you know, commercially available app drafting tools, they're much more user-friendly. They have various levels of functionality, um, and, and they're just really like an, another tool that practitioners can use to uh, facilitate the drafting process. So, Steve, what about, what about uh, your thoughts on, on how you came into patent law and automation? Well, yeah, so that was, that was actually very interesting, um, Michael. Yeah, so our entry into the market began back, I guess, about 26 odd years ago um, when a group of us that were working at another law firm, it was a terrific law firm, uh, but was uh, not as, uh, let's say, interested in automation as, as our group was, you know, started our own practice. And from the very beginning, you know, we we wanted to be as efficient as as efficient as possible. So we we started out automating everything we could very early, and it's just been a continuum ever since. It's become kind of built into Schweigman's DNA, if you will. Uh, most everybody here is is used to constant change with you know automation tools and various different things to keep us um, current and fresh. So that made, has made it a lot easier for us, I think, over the years to automate or to, to spend a lot of money on automation and databases and stuff, because we're all kind of on the same page here. Everyone's used to it. They consider it to be an advantage. It's not like trying to, you know, bring some people along that, you know, are, are stuck in the past. Everybody here is definitely uh, forward looking. So that's made it a lot easier. And so we've, you know, we started out, um, initially just trying to have a good database and when we started in the business there wasn't even really very many good prosecution management tools i mean you had docketing systems um you know some of which like cpi's system have not changed really materially at all since then other than they've gone out of the web but the the, the actual tool itself looks a lot like it did they've added a lot of extra features but Essentially, that shows you how slow things change in some ways. And so we started out and we built some much better tools for managing patent prosecution docket. Ultimately, we that, that tool was put on the web in the late 90s. Um, we thought that you know things should go on the web, uh, created Foundation IP actually, which CPA Global owns now. Um, we still use it. And that tool, when we first put it out, everyone thought, well, you're crazy to put your data you know, on a on a web server, no one's going to do that. Um, you guys are nuts, and it's never going to go anywhere. And of course, we we know where we are now. And then just by happenstance, we we had started digitizing. I wouldn't say this was happenstance, but we started digitizing our data early in our firm's history, and meaning we scanned everything originally using a paper port scanner system, which is now I think probably still around, but nobody uses it. Ultimately, everything got converted to you know PDF format. But so we started scanning everything like in the pretty much in the mid 90s, um, and we were we were using up storage space at a horrific rate. And we kept going, oh my God, we're not going to be able to afford it anymore. And the next year it would be half as expensive, and the next year it'd be half as expensive as that. So the cost kept dropping as fast as we kept adding data. But what happened from that was in the early 90s or uh, early 2000s when we needed to get some work done that we couldn't find anybody to do in the US because everybody was so busy, our data was online. And so we were able to push a lot of work to India by just essentially giving them a login ID. And of course, it was very tricky to make sure that everything was protected from export control perspective. Um, but we had built the system originally, Foundation IP, to have features in it to isolate data that was public from data that was couldn't be exported. So anyways, we we that was happenstance was the fact that we needed this work done and the, there was such full employment around that period of time. We couldn't find anybody in the IP profession that had any time to do proofreading, so we pushed it to India. So that that was kind of how we got sort of into the digitization era. And then from that point forward, we kept adding more tools. We we were the first ones, I think, that had our own analytics platform, which we still use uh, extensively. And we've got other tools, too, that I won't bore everybody with at this point. But a lot of them have to do with automating all the basic elements of practice 
And of course, the one that we're going to talk about mostly in a minute here is this uh, drafting automation. And I'm really interested to hear about what you've got uh, going on there, Michael. Well, Steve, just a, a quick question for you, which I think probably a number of people on the call are thinking about. For example, with Foundation IP or some of these kind of new analytics tools, how do you guys go through a decision whether you are going to develop it internally or buy it, buy kind of buy it from the market? Is there a process that you go through? Um, and is that a is that process you know maybe a competitive advantage for you that the way that you think about it? I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, it's that's a good question. If it's you know for the most part, we most of the tools we've developed, nobody else has really offered at the time that we started developing the tools. So it wasn't really a build or buy. It was it was a it was build or not have it. And you know, and then as time went on, people started to follow behind us with with other tools. Um, you know, and a case in point might be with analytics. Um, there, you know, there's uh, some of the early analytics systems um, that came online were, you know, simultaneous with what we were doing with analytics or trailing us a little bit. Now there's quite a few places you can get analytics. Um, what the main problem we've got with, you know, in general, if if you want to, uh, the build or buy function is or question is, if you if you buy, you know, you're definitely going to be trailing the market a little bit in terms of the level and sophistication and the level of customization of the automation. But you know, and so if you've got the ability to do it yourself, cost effectively it's 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 wonderful to be able to do that but on the other hand it's a lot cheaper if you can get somebody else to do go through the pain of developing it and sell it to you um and ready to go so i mean that's you know essentially we don't have a formal builder by process uh, you know, the decision making process here but we don't have too many things that we're in the middle of building at the moment other than you know uh, latest round of you know practice automation and the uh, essentially workflow and docketing area you know, one, one thing I'd like to ask to both of you is that a lot of what you're describing of this new technology, slow adoption, at the same time, when you were automating your firm, Steve, or Michael was, was spearheading that in his, you were looking at systemic issues across the firm and looking at ways to grow. At the same time, there's these interesting solutions and not all the attendees are from owners or principals. At the same time, we could see how this stuff will be creeping in and they have to look at their practice, their, their cases, and, and, and encouraging them for systemic improvements as well. I mean, so when you were looking at these things, digitizing documents, because I know that you were in Minneapolis, um, we had the dot-com boom and there was all this IP and all these patents going everywhere and it was crazy and you had to attract talent. You had to attract talent with decentralized people and digitized documentation. Mm -hmm. So how do you encourage uh, single you know, patent attorneys to look at their book of business and, and digitization and automation? I mean, how do, you, how, do you, how do you drill it down to a more individual level? Well, I guess I could take that first. I mean, really, today, I think a lot more firms are looking at outsourcing, not to India, uh, but, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, this is a subscription economy, if you will. So the, the functions that you can uh, outsource, uh, you know, in terms of, and I would say more software and, and things like docketing might be more susceptible to this, certainly, you know, a lot of the tools we use are subscription-based tools um, these days. But I think it's it's more trying to assemble uh, a team with as few uh, fixed costs as you possibly can, or people to manage. Because you know, the uh, people are are tremendously uh, difficult. You know, to to manage not because they're they're difficult people, but because uh, the cost and the work distribution, you know, uh, is 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 a lot harder if you've got a small volume of work to do. Like maybe you've got a docketing department and you've only got, you know, one or two people in that. If if somebody has to go out sick or for what for another reason, 
you know, how you back that department up is very difficult. So I think more people are going for a subscription, you know, on those types of functions. Um, you know, certainly the core practice of law, it requires, you know, well-trained professionals and great paralegals, and you got to have, you know, really well-trained attorneys that are capable in their field. That hasn't changed. Um, what is changing is the level of, of uh, support that you've got to throw around to help those people get their jobs done that you can pay to, to waste time. When I say waste time, do things that computers could do a lot faster, you know, um, because nobody wastes any time in our business, but sometimes we have to do things that are just not very uh, time efficient, you know, like, like sit and type in data into databases that could be just transferred with, with an API, for example, is just a, that's a waste of time. It's, uh, yeah, people don't even necessarily enjoy doing it. Um, I don't know, Michael, what, do you have any thoughts on that? So, Dan, I'm not sure I got your, your question, but I, you know, I could just make a couple comments. For the practitioners out there who are thinking, of, you know, should I use these new tools? I mean, the, 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 the answer is really clear. Um, the direction is um, there are a lot of tasks that are involved with patent applications that are repeatable and data entry and very rote. And I think everybody who has, has drafted, you know, patent, uh, patents for, you know, large clients knows this. And, it's, and the, the, the key is, do you want to get skilled in this area ahead of everybody else or not? Do you, you, you want to get those 10,000 hours of experience? Yes, you want to get those as soon as possible because still we're in a production-oriented business and the more applications that you can push out, the more efficiently you can push those out, and the more skills that you have around automation, the higher in demand you are. So I, if your question was, why should people use it, um, I, I think it's it's really becoming clear to a lot of, of, of folks. Um, the the, the, um, the charge for Steve and for me is, can we put together tools that everybody will use? And I can tell you that everybody on on my team uses our tools and they they would not go a day without using them because they're that they're that helpful and that beneficial and that was our goal when we started is you can't push this on folks but what you need to do is create tools that leverage this new wave of technology and and make them available and that's what that's what that, that's what we did, and it was it's been it's been really successful, and so um, I think that's really what all of the 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 owners on the call should be thinking about is how how can we get these tools in front of our practitioners so that we can compete effectively. Thank you. So going into the patent landscape and automation, can you talk a little bit about the spectrum of varying technology solutions and what you're seeing out there, Michael? Sure. Well, you know, um, on this slide, we, we've been talking, Steve and, and I have talked about most of these things, you know, and kind of the progression over time from, you know, uh, creating electronic files to docketing to, you know, more automated shell preparation and communications, um, automated IDSs, and then analytics have, have really come on in the last couple of years much faster than I thought that they would. So that's kind of um, what we have been seeing and what's arrived. I think the next generation, if, if you want to go to the, the next slide, um, you know, the, the, the biggest expense out there that's flexible is, you know, attorney or agent fees. Uh, and so that's what we thought um, was the next big thing. And the technology, Kind of arrived and has allowed us to do that. So assisted application drafting. Um, there are, you know, I think Turbo Patent might have been the first company that tried to to do this. Um, what we've seen lately is a lot of success out of a out of a company Specifio. Then there are, you know, a number of folks, Swedman, Parity, uh, Holland and Hart, that have created uh, internal tools that um, are very effective at generating simple or repeated sections and ensuring that 
Um, there's consistency across the application and there's appropriate numbering. Um, we also have innovated a lot in automated drafting and I'll, I'll show you some of those tools uh, later. Um, we've also done a lot of work in automating the, the office action response portion as well. So that's really what I, that, where, where we think there is uh, some, you know, some, some green field ahead and where, where we think that, that the market is going to go to in the next uh, 10 years or so. Steve, your yeah, thoughts? Think, yeah, well, actually, I, I, I basically agree 100% with everything you, you just said. And, you know, I think one, um, I think, thing to think about when you're, you know, planning your, you know, your firm's, you know, future um, technology, you know, acquisitions or, you know, what you're going to focus on is, you know, these small uh, percentage gains that can be picked up uh, by by automating more stuff really add up in a big way over time. And, you know, even a 5%, uh, you know, having 5% more efficient operation, you know, if you got a large operation, that's a lot of cash every year. And I uh, like to say around here, um, you know, if you want to get a sense for how much, you know, cash that is, just imagine taking that money that might be a 5% savings, you know, in operations and just dumping it out the window with a wheelbarrow. And most people are horrified at the idea of throwing money away like that. But yet a lot of people would, you know, with, without a second thought, uh, waste that kind of money on inefficient processes and, and, and internally. So I, I think these little advances inch by inch, and you talked, Michael, about working on your tool for many years, it's, a, it's an incremental business, it's an incremental change, it's an incremental change in people's behavior. And you know, one thing that we've, you know, of course, noticed about uh, you know, really good uh, patent paralegals and to some degree, a lot of times for attorneys too, is that um, they want to do things in a highly regular fashion because it generates very reliable work product and process. So it's oftentimes very difficult to get people to adopt new tools simply because it takes a lot of time to learn the tools. It, it can disrupt quality while you're learning it. And people's natures are sort of, they're almost selected to do things the same way every day because the last thing you want is a paralegal who decides to just do it their way every day, which is a disaster. So you've, you've got people that are naturally wanting to do things the same way and then you've got to get them to change. And, and the same thing applies to attorneys who you know, have ways they like to do things we all get in our habits and it's damn difficult to change those habits many times. So I think that whole process of, of automation, you know, with, 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 it, the more that you can take and do automatically before you give it to the attorneys so that they don't have any learning curve on using the tool, the better. Steve, that's such a, that's such a, a great point. I, th I think one of the, the hardest things, the biggest challenges we've had um, are on the recruiting front because it's so important to get people who are skilled, gifted practitioners who think, you know, who have very strong technical backgrounds, think analytically, very smart, but that that doesn't get you there. They, they need to be able to be flexible in their thinking and be willing to break habits and change and reinvent themselves. And um, it sounds like, you know, one of the things that really struck me is there's a culture of that at Schwegman and, um, and you know, many of our, uh, there's a culture of that at, at Holland at Heart with people regularly trying new things and, and changing the way uh, Way, the way the practice is done. So to me, I think, and I think we're going to get into this later, but one of the most important things um, that will bring success to, to, to law firms is ensuring that your people um, can embrace change and, and because a lot of change is coming. So there, you know, there's some questions that are popping up as we go here, Michael. One of them was just discuss the benefits of you know, we're going to talk about your drafting tool, but before you get into it a little bit, maybe, you know, what are some of the benefits of using an assisted drafting tool versus just using client-specific application templates? Well, maybe, Steve, I'll just walk through the tool right now and, um, uh, and then, you know, open it up to you for questions or comments. 
Um, Again, the way that we really started uh, with the tool is having a very structured approach to the way we draft applications, um, kind of a very predictable way that we have a system diagram and we have a number of uh, invention-specific pieces of the case. Then we end up with certain block diagrams and flowcharts, and that's the way most of our um, applications are drafted, particularly in the you know in the electronics and computer space. So that led um, to when we would hire people, they would often say this is a very rote, repetitive way to go. It's great because it leads to a very consistent product. But I, people started to, to say we can automate portions of, of it. So we started with, um, you know, the summary. And, you know, some of our clients wanted us to draft a full and complete summary with all the claims written out in their entirety. It was much better if we could just push a button and the summary would be created based on our claims than having someone spend two hours and write that. And um, so, that, you know, that's a, that's a first piece. We also then felt a very similar thing about, um, you know, method flowcharts. Um, you know, they, they really were very aligned oftentimes with the claims. Um, and so with, with the method flowcharts, and we'll, we'll get to those in a, in, in a sec. I'll, sh I'll show you examples of them. We thought, okay, we know what the claims are. Maybe we can kind of select what type of method flows we would want. And then the way that we describe those should be predictable. So over time, um, instead of actually having practitioners draft flowcharts um, and draft the supporting description, we created a number of tools to do those pieces automatically. The way our tool works is, as you're seeing right now, we have a UI um, for, for claim drafting and drawing design. And basically what we do is we just have um, the practitioner put in uh, method claims. They can draft them right into the tool itself, or they can you know, be added from a Word file. Um, then, basically, you can see up at the top there is next to a method claim, and, and maybe you could go back to the previous slide, Dan. Um, it, there, there's a, there's a, right next to the method it says assign a device. So what we start doing is um, in, the, in the claim section, we start associating different components of devices in this UI with different portions of the claims. And we basically create um, and I, I don't want to get too into our uh, trade secrets here, but we, we have a UI that allows us to tie certain portions of the claims to certain flowcharts and create flowcharts, create different types of block diagrams, and associate different method steps with different types of block diagrams. Um, once that is all set up, and it's a process that I think many of us go through when we're drafting patent applications, drafting claims, then imagining what the flowcharts are going to be, imagining what the block diagrams are going to be. We just set up an interface because instead of having you then have to go draft everything, it's predictable how those, those, those block diagrams and flowcharts should appear. So we program that all into the UI, and um, basically at the press of a button, if you go to the next slide, what comes out, we automatically um, can generate different claim types from our method claims. We can automatically generate custom drawings, and you can see the type of, um, you can see uh, a flowchart um, and a number of block diagrams that have been created automatically through our tool. The best thing, and the thing that really, um, that we really had to work very, very hard on is to automatically generate the custom specification to support those auto-generated auto drawings. Because when we first started, it was very hard to get um, the linguistics right, and so we had to invest in a lot of developers um, and, and really understand natural language processing on how to translate those claims to sentences that flowed nicely. And that took many, many years of iteration. So what you get now is you start off, you draft some, some claims, they go into the, the UI, you program what you want as far as the underlying technology, the the mapping of the claims to different flowcharts um, and block diagrams, and then you press uh, basically print, and you'll get 
most of the of the application, say 60% of it, um, pu pushed out. The rest of the application, which is really the most fun part for the, for the practitioners, is drawing what really is the inventive piece. Uh, and much of the rest of the, the, the application is just built to support the claims. But we can really spend much more of our time talking and, and discussing and flushing out the inventive pieces, because the rest of it is really repetitive. So what we really preach to our team is anything that, that you know, draft the claims, map out what you want, and then you have so much more of your time to really focus on what's new. And typically we have three or four of what we call narrative figures and the associated um, uh, description that, that's all done um, uh, you know, by, by, by the team and, and drafted. That's not, that's, that's not automatable. It's different in every application. Every drawing that is in is, is, is brand new, and it's something that we don't think that, that can be uh, automated uh, at, at this point in time because it's really the new part. So that's the big picture. And, and Steve, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on, on on kind of our strategy and, and, and what you think of the tool. Well, um, I think it's it's wonderful what you're doing there. It appears to me that it looks like this is a Visio. I can't, you know, I can't see exactly. If they, is that a Visio uh, interface for the that you're pushing it into, the uh, the yep. drawings? Yep. Yeah. It goes from the, the 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 UI. The output is Visio drawings. Yeah. And we we think that's you know that's a more ideal situation um, to be able to, to put these into tools that people are used to using. So now that's it's. I mean, I think what you're doing there is is absolutely wonderful. And I think what people would probably not appreciate is just how complicated it is to do something that, you know, it's at, at at the top level looks pretty simple, right? But I mean, that's just an enormous amount of complexity. And we haven't even looked at, you know, what you've done to, to actually draft prose that somebody would want to read, um, which is another big part of, you know, I think your tool is be able to generate the spec. So, I mean, I, I think what you're doing there is absolutely essential and really everyone's going to be using tools like this um, in the future uh, if they if they want to be cost competitive. Now, you know, obviously there's a lot of exceptions to that rule. There's, there's a lot of clients that are willing to pay uh, a lot of money to get something that's done by hand. Whether or not there's any value in that, uh, that uh, is, is sometimes questionable, but uh, there is a market for it. So we're not everybody's gonna be doing it this way, um, but this is definitely gonna be the wave of the future. And I think we'll see similar kind of advances, uh, you know, happening over at the patent office. I mean, they keep uh, investing a lot of money in technology and they're doing things too. So you're gonna see, Practitioners get more efficient. You're going to see the patent office get more efficient. And I don't think we're going to see less patent applications. I think we're going to see more higher quality patent applications uh, so that people can get even better protection for their IP um, at for the same amount of money they're currently spending. But no, I think what you're doing there is, is, is just wonderful, Michael. And uh, you're to be uh, commended for having the foresight and the stick to it in this to make this happen. And then the other thing I'd like you to do is just if you could send me the names of all your developers and their phone numbers. <laughs> uh, I would like to just talk to them, you know, a little bit. About they're happy there, you know, in Colorado. Anyways, uh, yeah. Anyways, you you got it, Steve. For, for <laughs> you, for sure. Um, so, see, one of the things that I, I did want to get your, your thought, if we could go back to the previous slide, and I think this is really a, a key point. Um, you know, our theory overall is that it's best if practitioners mostly work in places that they know already. So Word and Visio are areas that practitioners work a lot in, and we really want to push our tools into those areas. Other folks have said, no, we want to have a full new interface that people are going to have to learn that is going to be, you know, completely its own separate application because we can do so much more with it. Another group has said, we don't want to have any, um, any separate UI like we have. 
you know, they've said we should really have everything be in, say, a Word document, and you can press a button within the Word document and you can create new sections or new drawings from that Word document. Steve, I was I, I was wondering, like, what do you have a sense on on which strategy is is likely to 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 have success in the market more broadly? Um, and I, I hope that made that question made sense. Yeah, it does. You know. This is just my bias, but the problem with trying to make everything, and actually this is just a good point in general, which is um, trying to solve or to make the ultimate automation machine uh, at any point in time or for any particular problem is a really big mistake um, for IP at least, or at least IP automation, but I think it holds true largely for, for many other things too. It's better to incrementally, you know, evolve these tools. And, you know, if you gave the person that said, I want everything inside Word, I want it all automated, if you gave them all that, they would then find a reason why they didn't want to use it anyways. So the people that want to automate and are willing to change and to automate will use whatever's available to the best possible uh, ends. And the people that are sort of like, you know, not all that willing to automate typically just come up with one excuse after another as to why the tool isn't good enough or doesn't meet their needs far enough. So, I mean, I think trying to make a perfect tool isn't really even worth thinking about. I mean, you, what you want to do is have a tool that does 90, you know, as much of the work as you can, um, you know, for the least amount of money. And this is a good compromise, which is to have a essentially a tool that helps you draft put the initial draft together and then spin it over to the attorney and word and the visio have them put in whatever else needs to be done and then run some quality checks on it on the back end clean up the airs and put it out the door um you know that, i would assume that's sort of the philosophy you've taken here another way to look at it too across a lot of different you know industries with data sciences is integration of these things and you see APIs because there isn't the ultimate automation tool. And we have, I found the most success in, in the industrial space um, to be around uh, integrating into existing workflow systems like Visio. So you're right, the ultimate automation is not really there because we don't have enough programmers, developers or computing power processes to do everything from A to Z. So if you think of it as a bridge time or an adoption, I really think that integrating into the systems or workflows that they do is, is what people are really using. Yeah, and the other, the other thing to always keep in mind in the IP business, which um, a lot of innovators in the space run into, is it's a pretty small market. So, you know, you, you really don't have on the, you know, you can't monetize these investments in these automation tools um, as well as you could as if you were selling to, you know, uh, you know, a billion consumers. I mean, you're selling to a very small number of practitioners, especially when you think about the ones that are willing to do anything like this. So trying to put together the perfect tool on a budget that's going to allow you to get an ROI is pretty difficult and i think it it also kind of it, it it speaks to the problem we have in ip which is there's a lot of different there's too many systems that do too little in general um there's like everybody's got a ip management system and and if there was more of a market for all of them they could all be a lot better than they are but there just isn't that much money in it so i think taking the approach you did michael was a smart thing and, and, and just to tease it out Dan's point, to, to us, and, and Steve, I'd love to get your, your thoughts on this if you have anything else to add, but the way that, that we got broad adoption was to integrate things to the extent that we could in, you know, Outlook, Word, and Visio. The, the, the more closely integrated tools were into uh, people's traditional workflows, they used them 10 times as much. If, if they had to open a new interface uh, and learn something new, it, it really slowed down development. And, and so it seems like a very simple concept, but it, to us it was an epiphany, and it's what we always are driving towards is bringing the technology 
to current workflows and then migrating those workflows over time. Yeah, and I, you know, I would, I would uh, second that. And in, in fact, you know, here we've had um, some attorneys that have spent a lot of time innovating to bring, you know, our our back end to, you know, up to the dashboard, essentially to actually not to a special dashboard, but to, you know, Outlook, um, you know, so that there was a more natural integration between you know, managing your day-to-day -day calendar and, and managing your IP docket. And I definitely think a huge problem we've got right now in the IP space is this concept that we're all gonna be logging into each other's systems all day long and exchanging data there um, because it's, it's such a kludge. Um, and email turns out to be an incredibly efficient way to distribute information. Um, especially when you don't have you know um, a, a limited number of people that can be involved so that's just one example i think in the docketing workflow um, email is is still like one of the most popular ways to push information around not terribly efficient but if you can make it efficient it's way better than trying to get everybody to use some other tool which no one's going to want to do and probably won't use and they're probably the other tools aren't even nearly as good um, so that's 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 just sort of a I guess a F, F explanation mark on your point there. We're we're running okay. towards the end of our time, so we'll probably go five five minutes over time. Um, but um, maybe we can move it along, Michael, and we'll open up for some questions. Sure, that's uh, great. Do you have any other uh, uh, things you want to point out about your? I know, Michael, you've also got. Um, some office action uh, drafting tools that you put together and we could uh, why don't you just give us a minute overview of that because I know that was one of the things that we wanted you to, to talk about. Sure no it, we're also innovating in the office action drafting space you know we we have automation that basically parses an office action um, retrieves and highlights the references the relevant portions of the references that have been cited um, loads Kind of uh, a more dynamic active template in with a number of potential arguments based on uh, the specific rejections and then that dynamic shell then uh, goes out to our practitioner so it really replaces um, a lot of what our IP specialists were doing and allows the practitioner to suddenly in one space and, and, and Dan you might want to go to the next slide Um, and, and this is all within Word. Uh, as you can see, the, the, the left side of our, our screen, um, there's this dynamic shell. And then we have this uh, platform that allows all sorts of uh, links and different automation to different uh, pieces of the application and office action um, in, a, in a very integrated view. So that's what we're doing on the office action front um, and, and something I think that the, there are a number of different vendors that are offering different types of, of that as well these days. So see what should we should we turn it over to, to uh, let, let folks ask some questions? Yeah, we've got we've got quite a few, at least a number of questions. Uh, one of the questions um, is um, about using these tools for mechanical patent applications. Um, do you have any comments on on, on that? It's harder. Um, I, th I think, you know, what, what are the things that you really need that really kind of right now are required? Um, you know, high volume of applications that are very similar in many aspects. And once you get to more complex mechanical and medical devices, that, you know, sometimes where there are small incremental changes and you can, can spend much of the application uh, um, you know, it is similar or alike. Um, I think that, that there's some some advantages there, but it's unclear. You know, I, I think that the the, the true um, sweet spot is you know very high volume electronics and computer inventions that are based on similar systems. And as you get into more specific one-off mechanical devices. This type of drafting 
uh, style becomes harder. Uh, but I still think any type of flow charts and block diagrams can be done in an automated fashion and done well. So um, let's see, what other questions do we have here? Um, can you go up one from, from there, actually? Um, there we go. I just want to take a look here. Um, yeah, so what, I mean, I, I guess what we, the, the upshot of this is, you know, in terms of one question was, what are the benefits, you know, of, of uh, machine assisted drafting? And I think the benefits are cost savings and also improved quality. Um, so I think you get both and more consistent approach to drafting um, while preserving the creative legal you know the, the the lawyering part of the of the uh the practice um because the, the lawyer still has to tell the machine what to do um so i think those are the benefits benefits mainly cost savings and higher quality and steve one of the yeah steve and, and steve i'd agree with that you know what we found is the number of you know numbering errors and inconsistent you know the amount of inconsistent terminology uh, has just gone down really significantly. Um, when, when you have a more structured way that you draft applications and you work with certain inventor groups more often, they know where to find the, the parts of the application and they know um, what to look at and what is what they can trust and what's new. And so um, the review is expedited. Uh, the inventors are kind of comfortable with the way that it's 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 set up. Um, the, 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 another big aspect is, you know, as patent practitioners, nobody wants, I think there's oftentimes as, as patent practitioners, people talk about there being a grind. I think that grind is really about doing repetitive work over and over again. Um, what we found is our practitioners are constantly working on the new portions and doing new writing, new thinking, and it's, you know, the, the, I would say that the one, the one interesting aspect is at the end of the day, people are really tired because they've been thinking all day and doing, you know, really fun, but, you know, uh, uh, you know it's, it's, it's a lot of energy to do this type of work when you don't have the repetitive aspect. So um, there's benefits to the practitioners, and, you, you know, it's really you're doing, um, spending much more of your time adding value and really working in the fun part of the invention. Yeah, I'd, I'd definitely say that spending less time just trying to keep track of housekeeping in the application would save a lot of mental energy and frustration. So I'll kind of I'll, I'll go over this last slide here a little bit, or second to last slide, which is just paralegal, um, essentially, or, or docketing operations. And so just to speak to that a little bit, I mean, we were, I would say, five years ago, um, there wasn't very much uh, docketing automation at all. Currently, major vendors talk about docketing automation but really they've got very little all they do is is roughly perhaps identify what template might apply to a document but they don't do any of the actual thinking there are no fully automated docketing systems in the patent space except for the only ones i know about are are, are uh, put together by black hills ip and we've worked a lot with with them on, on automated docketing and i could just say this about it 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 is, it is simple in one respect and enormously complicated in another respect. And it really um, comes down to being able to look, when I say look, I mean in, in quotes, at all of the data that a docketer typically considers when docketing an item. And that, there's an awful lot of context that people don't realize that has to be considered and getting all of that context collected together in one place at the right time to make a docketing decision in digital form that can be consumed by you know a machine learning system or just by a set of rote rules or explicit rules is very very difficult and that's probably one of the biggest difficulties in docketing automation is just getting all the data you need um, in the right place now the data that docketers look at a lot of times is, is readily available to them, but it's not data that you can pull into a computer system very easily and look at. A lot of it's in paper, a lot of it's you know in other sources that aren't readily translatable to uh, digital. There's a tremendous amount of data coming from the patent office still that comes in forms 
that is not in pair and you need that form information and it's not even in digital form these are a lot of them are, are pdfs but bottom line is is that what's happening is that it's steadily getting automated and schweigman's now automated about 90 percent of its us on docketing is fully automated it goes straight out of the patent office in five minutes it's in uploaded into our into our database and ready to go and on the foreign side um that is rapidly advancing and there's a large percentage of our foreign docketing that's now automatically processed. And the benefits then just go right straight downstream because once you've got enough information to docket something, you can start doing a lot of other things with that document. So that's just my two cents on where we're headed with, with docketing. It's a lot simpler and harder at the same time. And the last point I would like to make then automated drafting, which requires so much more creativity than docketing, which is all predetermined. Um, but last thing I'd like to point out is that there's a uh, organization called Open Legal API, and anybody who'd like to go there and sign the petition, this organization is really set up to encourage all of the vendors in the industry to have open APIs. And what I mean by that, I don't mean that they're open to the public, but that they're open between um, vendors and law firms and third-party vendors um, so that uh, corporations can exchange data readily with law firm systems. Law firms can exchange it with their docketing providers. There's no silo lockout of, you know, uh, integrated with vendors that try to keep everybody out of their API so that they can try to sell you India docketing services, which are fine, but um, are not necessarily the most competitive. So you can go to openlegalapi.com if you want to sign up for that. And Michael, do you have any last comments before we call it a day? Steve, I, would, I just think it would be great for you um, if, if you could kind of tell us what you think the characteristics of the successful patent law firm of the future, I mean, what are the key things that, that people need to do to compete and, and be effective in this kind of this, this new frontier? And uh, I, I'd, love, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, I'll, I'll kind of boil it down to... Um, a couple things. I mean, one is obviously you've got an increasingly sophisticated uh, customer base. Um, so you have to be really good at what you do from a, a lawyering perspective. I mean, you have to have great legal skills. You've got to have well-trained people. You have to have top professionals. That is the core of the business. Um, then the next thing you need to do to stay competitive, I think, going into the future is you got to give them the very best tools that are available. And, you know, you think of it as, as you know, if it's a bunch of people trying to chop down trees, you know, you, you got to give them a, a chainsaw. You, you know, you don't want them out there with, a, you know, with an ax. And I think uh, what you put together, Michael, is the chainsaw to the patent drafting process. And what you need to do is you got to have a lot of chainsaws around your office these days if you're going to stay competitive. And if you don't, you're just going to become less and less and less competitive. And I think the, the economic pressures are gonna be harder and harder to, to, to withstand. That's my, that's my take on uh, what the future is. Michael, any Great. last thoughts with yourself on the future? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I think, you know, I second everything that, that Steve said. Um, I'd, I'd also say just, Focusing on recruiting the right talent, um, and not just the smartest talent, but uh, people who are flexible thinkers and um, you know are, are are out kind of to embrace this this brave new world. You know, you need as many great attorneys as you have, but you also need great leaders and thinkers and people who are going to try new things. And um, the the, the nice thing for us is we built a, a, a team of renegades that really want to kind of question everything about the process. It sounded a lot like what Steve had in mind when he uh, created his firm. And I, I think that that type of uh, the need to question the way things are, you need to have a number of people in your firm who are um, doing that, both um, in the more senior leadership and, and, and the new talent that you're bringing in. 
Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I just wanted to say that this webinar was sponsored by Black Hills IP, a leading provider in IP and docketing automation. This is recorded, so we'll send out a recording link to the people that were um, on the webinar itself. And Michael, where can people reach you if they're interested in uh, learning more? Um, Michael Drapkin, Holland and Hart, and uh, if you just put it into Google, happy to answer any questions or follow up with anybody. So thanks, everyone. And Steve, Thank you, Michael. Steve, can, they can reach you out on LinkedIn or sure. Simon Lundberg and Wasserman. Yeah, at slundberg at slwip.com. Thank you very much, folks. Thanks for attending. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Right,